welcome. Welcome to Network Architectures for Growing Academic Open Source, uh, being presented today by Bradley Alicia. Bradley is the Open Source Community Manager for Rock, Rock Wire Initiative. Bradley is currently the Manager of Open Source Community Activities at Rockwire and runs the Open Source Rotation YouTube channel. He has academic interests spanning the biological, computational, and social sciences. Bradley's open source endeavors include head scientist and founder or founder of Orthogonal Research and a senior contributor at the Open Worm Foundation. Welcome, Bradley, and thank you for being here. Hi, uh, thank you for having me. Uh, I, I have a copy of the slides in the conference platform, so if you go to this talk, in the conference platform, you can get a copy of the slides and you'll see that these animations work in this front page. So the title I'm going to talk about today is uh, Network Architectures for Growing Academic Open Source. So I'm going to talk about three different or open source organizations today. Uh, one of them is the Rockwire Initiative, which is an open source community based at the University of Illinois. Uh, the second one is the Orthogonal Lab. It's an independent collaborative entity focused on research and education. Uh, and then the Openworm Foundation, which is a 501c open source organization that engages in software development and research. Uh, so I'm going to start with talking about uh, sort of academic open source. And people have been interested in the topic of how academic departments operate for a long time. So this paper is from 1971. It's a management paper, and they talk a little bit about the organization of a traditional academic department or academic organization. And it's a very top down type of organization. So you can see that open source can open up some of this hierarchy, and we'll talk a little bit about that later. But for now, just keep in mind that we're kind of disrupting uh, academic activity with some of these uh, things I'm going to show you today, and that the, it's, it's a shift from what we've traditionally thought of as the norm. So uh, one of the things that's driven this shift is COVID-19. So uh, with the orthogonal lab and with open norm, those things existed before COVID-19, but COVID-19 represented a, a significant shift in how things were done, both in those sorts of organizations and in universities. And so this is a tweet on the left from uh, PLOS headquarters in San Francisco, where they, you know, they, they had to work from home and they didn't have their uh, access to their office, so they had to readjust the way they worked. And so this is something that we are trying to replicate in these type of academic open source communities. Uh, virtual distributed communities are robust to rare unforeseen events that adversely for, affect traditional institutions, such as a pandemic. As long as the enabling technologies are in place, which I'll, I'll go over some of those in the talk, these events can actually increase community activity. So what I found with in terms of the orthogonal lab is that there was a massive increase of activity in our, in our organization during the pandemic because we offered things that the traditional uh, universities could not offer at the time or people were looking for opportunities to uh, interact online. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the orthogonal web first. And so this is, uh, I wrote a preprint on this at Mata Archive. If, if you have the slides, you'll get the link to this. Uh, it's called Building a Distributed Virtual Laboratory Adjacent to Academia. So what we've done is taken like a lot of the different components of academic research and some teaching components and turn this into a participatory distributed virtual organization. And so it takes a lot of cues from open source, traditional open source, and maybe some new uh, features. But uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about that. So we use a lot of enabling technologies such as chats, uh, chat uh, uh, platforms like Slack and Discord. We use uh, virtual conferencing uh, software such as uh, Jitsi. And we use uh, you know Google Docs and other types of collaborative doc, doc uh, uh, platforms to exchange, you know, documents and presentations. And then we use GitHub to uh, publish and share code. So all those things, you know, we try to leverage those things in different ways. We have participants from all over the world, as you can see, from Asia and Europe and uh, North and South America. And, you know, it's, it's a challenge with the time zones. But other than that, you can actually uh, find your way through. And so, uh, this, this is an example of us in action here. 
these are our weekly meetings where we have people, this person's from India, this person's from North America, this person's from another part of North America. And we have people from Germany and India again and uh, some other places in the world. So we get a lot of participation from across the world, people wanting to part a lot of undergraduates and you know other people who are wanting to learn how to do research or looking to get involved in research in other ways at different career stages. So it's very enabling. And um, so, you know, one of the things we do here in, in, in terms of organizing things is we don't really fall into those buckets of a, of a traditional organization. Uh, we kind of uh, organize ourselves around topics. And those topics, you know, are what people are interested in at different times. And we have these different research topics that we've developed. And so the idea is to link these together in ways that you wouldn't find in a traditional uh, organization, academic organization. So we don't have departments so much. We have topics that get linked together depending on when people are working on them, depending on how much participation we have in a different area. And so these things are very flexible. Um, but how do we translate academic community building? And a lot of this is community building. A lot of the engagement and involvement of people is community building. How do we translate this into build this into the language of complex networks? So I gave this talk at a network uh, science conference. So I'm going to get into like how we can characterize this with networks so we can provide some sort of quantitative evaluation. Um, so what is the structure of networks for open source collaboration? That's sort of the big question uh, we can ask by using network uh, techniques. And we find that open source communities are transient flexible and hierarchical. This term hierarchical is different from hierarchical. And because hierarchy implies that there isn't like a leader and a follower or someone supervising someone else. It's more that you're coming together. Some people have some skills, other people have other skills. You, you sort of make your own organization and you make your own sort of, uh, you know, accountability from that sort of connection. Most importantly, the organization is organized around that and enables that type of, of organization. So it's different from a hierarchy. So hierarchies uh, are defined by our nodes who are participants or topical areas and being able to rank these in a number of different ways. So in a hierarchy, you have a strict ordering of your topics or your people and one person reports to another or one topic is nested under another. Uh, in a hierarchy, that's not the case. These things get organized uh, in a way that's flexible based on who's doing things, who's, uh, you know, uh, taking leadership, taking, you know, um, or, or, you know, what, what's, uh, you know, if people were working on projects at different times of the day, uh, you know, the, the sort of the uh, organizational structure shifts accordingly. So aside from, you know, sometimes we have project leaders who are sort of fixed, but aside from that and their initiatives, there are num a number of ways to become connected into and gain connectivity into these networks. So I can join the organization, I can join a project, I can join another project, I can shift between projects. And as long as I do certain tasks or certain issues, you know, uh, address certain issues, I'm, you know, working on a project and it helps me build skills and it's, it, you know, it's a, I'm doing something and I'm, I'm persisting in the community. Um, there's also a low barrier to entry in, in such a network, uh, meaning that preferential attachment rules. And if you know anything about networks, you know that's sort of the way that we think about networks, such as social networks, where you join an organization, you look up to a leader, and you, uh, you know, gain your cues from there. We don't necessarily, that's not necessarily applicable, applicable in these type of communities. You have people who are leaders, but they're not, you know, strong leaders, you might take cues from other collaborators and so forth. Finally, open source networks have multiple functions and objectives. And so there are different roles for people, different ways they can interact. And it depends on where they are in the world, you know, who's who's active in the community at any given time and so forth. Uh, one of the concepts here to think about is one-to-many interactions. So not only do we have people coming into the network and there isn't really this clear hierarchy, but we have this ability to connect to many people simultaneously. So you can explore the community, you can explore the academic community as you wish, and you can connect to who you want to connect to. And it's much, I think, much 
easier for people to navigate, especially in academic uh, research where you're trying to find the right fit. And this is a way, this is an example of an open source community, uh, software uh, community, but this principle also applies to what we're talking about. Another thing I like to talk about when I talk about this is the reconfigurability of expertise. So this is something I've found across our different communities here. This is important for academic open source in that, you know, if we want to do a large scale project, we have people with different skills in the community. And so depending on what we're doing at any one time, we can draw from that community and get people involved. So this is an example I give where, you know, we have this task and then we can group people in the community based on their skills and then you know you put out a call for involvement they come in they do the work and then they go do something else so something like web design and maintenance which is something that happens on a regular basis you have people maybe lined up for that or you have people who join in and, and contribute their skills in the open worm foundation we've done that a number of times to update the website uh, something like designing a new module for a course or from some software. This happens maybe on, during a summer period. And again, you bring people in who are involved at a certain time. They have summers off. They can do things during the summer. And so these people aren't in the community all year long, but they come together at this point in time. Uh, so these are two examples of reconfiguring expertise. And I, I find this to be, you know, when you look at it in the light of academic organizations, it's very refreshing because you usually don't have that. Um, so we think about networks, these kind of networks as contributors being the nodes, which are the dots that you'll see in these diagrams, and the strength of the connections or edges, which are the links of the connections between the nodes or the contributors. And so we're trying to find pathways to sustainability through looking at these networks, but looking at their statistical trends. So looking at these connections and their connectivity give you statistical trends that you can uh, look at and examine and appreciate. Um, so one of the cues that we've taken for academic networks are these uh, co-citation networks, which you find in, in the academic literature. So these are these nodes actually are papers and they are clustered according to different topical areas. So we've used this as sort of a cue because we're dealing with people who have specialties or interests in topical areas. And you know, if we can link them together, not only by their topical area, but between topical areas, we can build these networks. And these networks aren't necessarily hierarchical, it's heterarchical, as we've seen before. Um, so this is something that uh, you know, we've, we've kind of taken cues from here. Um, but I'm gonna move now to Rockwire, which is uh, the uh, one of the other things I work on. And so uh, the idea here is we're building smart campuses and smart communities. So it's a mobile app that is modeling the university. And so the university is a very complex system. It has a lot of components here. You can see the different parts of the university, what campus events, data security, libraries, wellness, transportation, those are all components that have different sort of uh, footprints in the university. And so the idea of you know, having something software that incorporates everything in the university is uh, a very complex system and it's a network of people interacting. So the app actually deals with a lot of data from different individuals and presents it to people, but those people interact in networks. And then our open source community actually brings in people from these different networks, brings them into the setting of an open source community where people can contribute to the software they can contribute to the design of the app or whatever. Um, so I'm going to move on now to this idea of um, a little bit more about like networks and how people can fit into the community. I said before that uh, preferential attachment is usually not the way we deal with things, but there are sort of attachment rules. So, you know, one of the questions you can ask by looking at this in terms of networks is that which contributors and disciplines are your greatest source of contributor activity? And so in a, on a campus, like I just showed you, there are a lot of different components to the campus, different functions, different departments. And say I have someone from this group A, it could be a department, and they fit into the network in this way. And they naturally attach themselves into the network based on maybe affinities or maybe what they're doing at the time, like a task, like I showed you those circles. So they're fitting themselves in the network in a certain way. And so we have to kind of understand where our contributors are coming from, what disciplines are coming from and how they fit into the, the agenda. In the case of Rockwire, it could be what kind of functions or what kind of features can we develop 
given the expertise we have. And so say we have input, the input of contributor from discipline A or group A uh, in, in our community, we, in the Rockwire community, we've had people doing foreign language translations of parts of the app. We've had people from uh, des the design community working on app design. So people are plugging themselves into the uh, community network and they're interfacing with the software. And so then you have to ask your que the question of these people, knowing that they come from a specific place, uh, what kind of niche expertise do they bring into the community? So someone from design will come in with a design background and that will shape what you can do in your community. Uh, the second is, do they act as a conduit? Do they bring more contributors from discipline A? Um, and then, you know, that's that means that they're reinforcing their numbers in that small group of people and they're gonna build this sort of uh, sub-network that uh, you know is maybe doing things specialized in that area. Uh, and then thirdly, the duration of con contribution, the intensity of contribution are important because that allows you to have these areas that persist in the network. So what is the magnitude of their contribution history? And then this depends on this this determines how this network is shaped, how you can draw from that expertise and so on. Um, so we have this idea, it's sort of a take home from looking at these networks. And the idea is that networks exhibit long tails, which means that you have maybe some contributors who contribute a lot, but a lot of contributors that don't contribute very much. That's a statistical long tail. It just means that there's a tail of the distribution of like contributors and the number of their contributions. And it's like, there are a lot of people in that tail. There are a lot of people maybe contribute like sort of in an itinerant fashion or whatever. So you have to serve those people, but you also have to be mindful of the people who contribute a lot because they're the ones that are sort of shaping this community. So we know that there are these long tails and I'll show you an example later, but only for certain modes of engagement. So knowing the modes of engagement, like what I said before, if you get people from translation, foreign language translations or design, those people are gonna be, you know, they're gonna shape what your community looks like, the expertise you can draw from and so on. And so these long tails are uh, context dependent. So this is some data from Wikipedia. I'm just taking this in as, a, as a, an example of these long tails. So this is the log edit count. So this is like, uh, this doesn't distinguish between individual uh, categories of, uh, of contributor, but you can see that some contributors contribute a lot a very small number of contributors, and then a lot of contributors contribute less. And so that sort of relationship is, is there in the Wikipedia data. These are the categories um, here, uh, like contributor categories, and you can see this replication where you have a, uh, some categories where you have a lot of individuals. These are sort of low-level positions, and then as you get more specialized, you get fewer and fewer contributors, but they all kind of form this community, and they don't necessarily form a hierarchy. They form these hierarchies that are, um, you know, uh, based on, you know, hierarchies may be based on things like trust, but hierarchies based on like opportunity and things like that. It's not as pronounced in Wikipedia as maybe some of these academic communities, but in any case. Um, and so this is, these are the top five roles in Wikipedia that accounts for uh, a lot of the edits. So there are these, you know, roles that are very low level, uh, but then the rules that are high level and that that there is a difference there in, in terms of how much people are contributing, how many people are doing those jobs. So this is something you see in Rockwire community replicated. You see you have these different uh, uh, bad, we have this badge system that has, you know, for different roles in the community. So if you attend a meeting, you get a red badge. If you're involved in a publication, you get a black badge get have activity green badge and, and so forth. And so this is what the distribution looks like. This is uh, the number of badges awarded. So we had like, in this sample, it was like 21 individuals uh, where you wanted to look at like what kinds of badges they earn. So people can earn more than one badge and you have people who have badges in common. And so you see this sort of thing where community building is very rare. People don't do that very much, but people, a lot of people attend meetings and a lot of people contribute to conceptual and technical advances. You might predict that would be a little lower on the list, but anyways, um, education being low as well. So these are, um, you know, we can look at the 
way that people contribute to the community in this way. And there we can see a long tail. But you can also make these network graphs. And so uh, this is a full community network based on that same sample. And what this network is based on is the badges that people have in common. So each of these dots represents a contributor and each of these lines represents a badge that they have in common. So you see it's it's kind of messy. You can't really see much structure. You can see some triangles here, which are actually important in network analysis. Um, but you can actually look if I took uh, just myself as a community manager and I have every badge because I'm kind of leading this. Um, and then I take, uh, you know, the people who have at least three contributor badges, you can see a structure emerges where there is this hierarchy, but it's local. They don't see this replicated across the net, across the community, just amongst these people who are contributing a lot and very broadly. So that's, that's an interesting signature. Another interesting signature is when you take out the community manager and you just look at people who are contributing, uh, you know, uh, maybe they're not interacting, maybe they are already interacting but they have this, these unique number of badges in common. And you can see that there is this, you know, there is this difference in pattern and you can analyze this with network statistics, which I won't present here, but you can see that the changes the network significantly when you do that. Um, so this uh, Rockware initiative is a community network that is connected into the campus community. So it has a lot of, uh, you know, interesting properties. You know, it's, it's you know, you have, like basically you're a network within a network, you're drawing from uh, a formal academic structure. So you're drawing from departments, you're drawing from expertise, from interns with different types of expertise. And uh, it's a, so it's an interesting system to study. Now, that being said, there needs to be, uh, there's a need here for network enrichment metrics. In other words, how many interactions in the community uh, impact or enrich the adjacent adjacent academic community. So there are opportunities here to take like an open source community within a uh, university and see how they interact with uh, your traditional departments. Maybe they enrich the departments, maybe the departments enrich them. We don't really know. Uh, but this is an example from the Open Room Foundation. So I'm also involved in the Open Room Foundation. And it underscores this role of in these kind of academic communities these long tails. And so in the open worm community, we have uh, people trying to simulate the organism C. elegans. So we have people doing like biophysics simulations, we have people doing neuronal simulations, behavioral simulations. And all of these people are, you know, the, this has been going on for uh, at least since 2011. But this is a sample from 2016 to 2020 of 228 contributors. And we have in the Open Room Foundation specialized roles. So we have uh, senior contributors who tend to lead the projects. We have Google Summer of Code students. We have a board of directors. We have major collaborators from academia, more traditional academic labs and the like. And so if you look at who's contributing, and this is by the number of Slack messages, so this is an imperfect measure. But if you look here, you'll see that you have a number, all of your specialized roles exist up in this part of the distribution. And the tail is almost exclusively made up of other types of contributors. And these maybe are more casual contributors. Um, and there's some of these types of people up in this uh, main mode of the distribution, but most of these people, these other types of uh, contributors are in this long tail. And I think what this suggests is that some of the uh, sig network signatures we've seen before are due to like maybe different types of expertise, but some of them are simply just assigning roles in your community and promoting, you know, people taking the initiative and taking leadership. And that that shows up in, in the way that the number of interactions they make. So this is, you know, you can see these different properties of this uh, semi hierarchy, this heterarchy. And, you know, this is an interesting way to look at it. So in the multi-level network topology that we're building, you know, we have an onboarding network, which is where you have people who, you know, you have a small number of curators in the community that connect everyone. So this is like this preferential attachment idea. Uh, and it's kind of turned on its head because we're sort of uh, purposefully connecting people through a small number of leaders. Uh, we have these collaborator graphs, which we can use, say a Slack team as an indicator where everyone's interacting with a subset of channels and we get 
uh, maybe a similar signature, I'm not really sure, but we have these onboarding networks, collaborator graphs, and then a participation graph where people collaborate sort of spontaneously through meetings or through asynchronous and synchronous discussions. And we haven't really looked at that as much, but they have a, a similar signature. Uh, I'm not gonna include the graph in this talk, but but just take my word for it that they, they all look very similar. So you can combine these networks in different ways as well. And so this is an example of the overlap in some ways and some ways they don't. So the final lesson here is this lesson of selective disconnectivity and intentional interconnectivity are key. So these are two things that we've observed is that people can be connected to certain groups, certain channels, but not in a way that's like, you know, top down but also that people join these uh, groups based on affinity or based on what they're working on. And so these things kind of work together to build these communities and to build the kind of structure that you see in these communities. Um, but they're quantitative, somewhat quantitatively elusive. So they actually help to evolve this network. So again, we return to this reconfigurability of expertise. You're constantly exchanging members into different groups based on the needs or based on people's interests or whatever. Um, there's flexibility and membership between different modules in the network over time. And you have this network robustness assessment. So this is a pseudo graph where I've shown if you remove the number of edges in a community, if you remove connections between people, and then you look at like the number of nodes in the largest big component of the network, and I'm not going to get into what that is, but basically what you find is that in this part of this graph, uh, people tend to yoke themselves to a single community manager or connect to the most popular contributors. So this is this uh, preferential attachment mode. This is if selective connectivity is too limited. Uh, we tend to replicate the structures of a traditional academic organization. So if you don't let people, you know, if you don't give people guidance or you give them too much guidance sometimes and don't let them form their own um, path, and that cuts off sort of how they're self-selecting their connectivity, then you can end up with this kind of situation. It's not ideal because it doesn't really unlock the power of these Senate organizations, in my opinion. This being in this regime is a little bit, maybe a little bit uh, suboptimal as well. This is if selective connectivity fluctuates too much at long time scales. In other words, if people aren't like kind of guided into certain things, but also aren't allowed to explore or if these things are uneven over time. So if like people get really excited in a, on a project and then just disconnect from it, and then no one picks up this slack and you know these sorts of things, basically where the organization, the community just kind of falls apart because no one's interested. Um, network robustness hits a critical lower bound. So you risk community collapse. This is where too many people withdraw interactions for months or years at a time. So that's another thing we want to avoid. Um, the optimal is to be in the middle of this area here, which is a balance of all these things. And so um, I hope that that was helpful to you. Uh, thank you for your attention.